Lantern. Welcome to another lecture given by the members of the Ithaca New York class. My name is Sharon Welch and I'll be your moderator for this class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated in showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in 1958. Since that time, we have established branch schools throughout the United States, Canada, and other certain foreign countries. The Ithaca class was established in 1979. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Ithaca class, Dr. Robert White, and our host, Dr. Greg Prestis. Now in this school, we teach by, the, um, sorry, in this school, we teach by the names of the Father, Yahweh the Father, Elohim, Word or Son, and Yahshua, the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been, been mistranslated to read Lord. <clears throat> the true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been mistranslated to read God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been mistranslated to read Jesus. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, states in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and that there are God's many. And we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that is a title that the creator chose for himself. Now, Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah improper renderings of the true name of the Father and his Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit. And in that state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. Now we have this fiery cloud painted all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, this self same spirit <clears throat> manifested himself and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world erroneously calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question you should ask yourselves is what was the name of the Messiah at the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of the name and title can be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of it is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai 
and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about in this group to show proof how that everything in the universe abides within this, uh, made in, um, by this tabernacle pattern that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. We have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives. They are as follows. First, is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. <clears throat> Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered on the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved, saving the name Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to have the class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Rochelle Morgan. <clears throat> and that'll be followed by a scripture, which is 1 John, the fifth chapter. And that'll be read by Dr. Reba Sahar. And uh, Dr. Margaret Chivison will be our uh, other reader, scripture reader for this evening. Dr. Morgan. Michelle, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. I didn't know you called me. Um, good morning. Good morning. It is always a pleasure to have something to say about. I'm um, asking you to this. say the prayer, Rochelle. Oh, good. Hallelujah. Uh, let's give all praise and honor to glory to the Holy Spirit. And um, get, as Frank likes to say, give our undivided attention to the uh, Heavenly Father, Yahweh, through our Savior, Yahshua, the Messiah. We ask that you lay out your cares of the world aside and that you um, really try and listen to the speakers and see what Yahshua was saying through them. And um, thank you. Hallelujah. Good morning to the class. This morning, morning will be first John the fifth chapter. Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Messiah, is born of Yahweh, and everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him, also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh, when we love Yahshua and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous, for whatsoever is born of Yahweh overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yahshua is the son of Yahweh? 
This is he that came by water and blood, even Yahshua, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of Yahweh is greater. For this is the witness of Yahweh, which he hath testified of his son. He that believeth on the son of Yahweh hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not Yahweh hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that Yahweh gave of his son. And this is the record that Yahweh hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in Yahshua. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of Yahweh hath not life. These things have I written unto you, and believe on the name of Yahshua, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of Yahweh. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and it shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of Yahweh sinneth not. But he that is begotten of Yahweh keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of Yahweh, and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of Yahweh is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know that him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Yahshua. This is the true Elohim and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Morgan and Dr. Sahar. We will have a three speaker format for this class. And for our first speaker, let's call on Dr. Judy Turner from our uh, Tampa, Florida class. Hello, everyone. Hi, Judy. Um, I am not in a position to be able to um, speak today. I appreciate the opportunity because this is all we have. Yahshua is all we have, but I am not going to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turner. We'll call on the second speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Donald O'Connor from our Rhode Island class. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Go. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have a few words to say. Can I have um, 
the 20th verse of the scripture reading, please. First John 5 and 20. And we know that the son of Yahweh is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Yahshua. This is the true Elohim and eternal life. Are you there, Dr. O'Connor? Yeah, here I am talking. I forgot to unmute. Okay. <laughs> um, I found it interesting thinking that there was a time we were all brand new coming into this organization. And of a truth, we did not know anything about our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And after being here for quite a few years, it's my testimony that, well, we do know and we have been given an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are finding out that we're definitely in him that is true, even in his son, Yahshua. Now, right within this 20th verse, this was one of the first things that we got introduced to, that the name of the father was Yahweh. The name of his son was Yahweh Elohim. And him manifested in the flesh was known as Yahshua the Messiah. Now, those are things that we would just were not taught out here in the world especially at myself, I came in in Roman Catholicism and they taught us the name of the father was Lord. The name of the son was God. If you think about it a minute, they're titles. Those are not names. And all we kept doing was saying in the name of the father, the name of the son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And not once did they tell us what the name of the Holy Spirit was, or even that there was a name. They said he was a dove. Well, you right. the Messiah is the name, I mean, the Holy Spirit. He's not a dove. So I found it interesting that realizing that we didn't know, one of the first things that we were taught, and I'm sure a lot of you remember this as clear as I do, we were told to read the book of Exodus in the Bible. And, you know, we didn't know with it. <clears throat> we knew we had a Bible at home sitting on a shelf somewhere if we were Roman Catholics, but we weren't encouraged to read it. But if we wanted to know something about our creator, the first things that we were taught was read the book of Exodus. And I think it was Dr. Mitchell, I know it was him, who told us, I'll take care of the rest. Because back in the book of the Exodus is where a lot of the information that you're seeing on this chart in front of you right now, called the Moses chart, where, oh, uh, let's do this. Let's get five, uh, John 539, please. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, another thing that, uh, well, we did not know when we came into class, and being a Roman Catholic, I know they used to teach all kinds of things out of the Gospels, which they called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they never read this particular uh, verse to me. In my mind, they just ignored it. Because that would have meant they would have had to go back to the law and the prophets because the scriptures are literally the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then the next 34 books uh, in the prophets from Joshua to uh, Malachi. So it's back in those scriptures that you're going to have to come what he has made available to us so that we could come into an understanding of him. Now, if that's how you can come into an understanding, you would think it would be a good idea to follow what he's saying to do. And if you don't, you'd have to start realizing that, well, maybe you don't really want to come into an understanding if you're not willing to do as he's requesting. Uh -huh. And one of the first things when I started thinking about this was um, there are so many ideas there are so many things about the Messiah and about Yahweh and his purpose that we can be discussing. Um, 
I want to take something because it, it's so real nowadays, and then I can get back into the law of the prophets and explain it to you. But everyone's captivated right now, or their minds are just captured with everything that's going on with Russia and the Ukraine. And everyone's seeing the devastation and seeing the um, uh, turmoil that's over there. But I've been caused because of a lot of things that are going on in my life and in my own experiences to look at uh, a lot different picture. Because if you watch what's going on, the man called out for help being uh, Zelensky, the uh, person in charge of Ukraine. And all you're seeing now is him being provided for. So you're seeing the spirit of a provider providing sustenance, providing the arms and everything that this man needs to counteract the things that are going on uh, from the Russians trying to take over the Ukraine. So I want to deal with a few minutes with the idea that the one who we worship, the one that we understand, is truly a provider. Um, Greg, Greg, can you give me the uh, IRA chart real quick? And then I'm going to need the elementary chart. Now, if you can see down in the fourth step of the tabernacle, and I really don't have time to get in all of these steps, but it mentions the word provider. And if somebody's got a, <clears throat> got a dictionary, please get me the word provide and hang on to it. And please make sure I get back to it. But in this tabernacle, the fourth step that's calling provider, it's a characteristic or it's a covenant or an agreement that Yahweh made uh, in this particular instance with Abraham when he provided himself a lamb. But I want to run the idea. I want to run the principle. And so you can see the manifestations that are so clearly evident out here right now, this day in the creation that you're seeing this spirit in man and they're just wanting to help uh, the Ukraine with everything they need is being provided for. Well, why would that be? Because it's a characteristic, it's a notion, it's an example, it's a manifestation of the spirit of Yahweh or something that's in actually Yahweh Elohim manifested to the inhabitants of his creations. Greg, can you go to the elementary chart? I want to start right back in the Garden of Eden, because if you go back into the Law and the Prophets, how the Messiah had asked us to do, so that we could come in into an understanding of how him and his purpose works. Well, if you read one of the first things that goes on in the Genesis, Yahweh Elohim, uh, if I can say it this way, Yahweh created Yahweh Elohim, and what we were told was Yahweh went out of the creating business. You'll read that Yahweh Elohim, the first six days of creation is all recorded about after the first day he said it is good second day he said it's good so on and so forth for every day of the creation well what he ended up doing was he made everything out of his own substance that was in the world it was made in abundance so much so that when adam the man was first formed out of the dust of the ground all the new nutrients that were in that ground was there to sustain his life so much so when he was placed in the garden of eden the trees were heavenly laden with fruit so here yahweh had provided uh his first the manifestation of his first son in the physical with everything that he needed to sustain life so much so he, all he had to do was go over and pick the fruit of the trees right. so here's an example back in the garden of him being a provider providing for a man's every wish that he needed and everything that was going to be needed to keep him alive. Now, if we run over to Noah, the same thing is going on. Noah was given a vision. Noah was given all these people to help him build that ark because it was going to be, uh, it was going to rain at that time. The world was going to be destroyed because of the wickedness of mankind. But Yahweh provided Noah with all the, with not only the vision, but with all the things necessary for him when he was going to be going into the new creation 
so that he had everything provided for him that he would need to be able to sustain life in the new creation. When we go over to the birth of Isaac, you're going to read in uh, Genesis, it's, I think it's 22, 13 uh, and 14, that Yahweh, Abraham was told of Yahweh to offer up his son Isaac. And all of a sudden, as Abraham was bringing him up the mount, he stayed Abraham's hand from slaughtering Isaac and just said, Yahweh has provided himself a lamb. So he's providing a sacrifice, which is typifying Yahshua the Messiah, who we find out John called him uh, uh, the lamb of Yahweh. When we go over into the children of Israel. Oh, you see it again. He's providing for the children of Israel. It says for 40 years, none, nothing ran out. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't run out. Everything, uh, they had manna for 40 years. He was a good husband under them. He just kept providing, providing. Bunch of definition? Um, uh, no, not, not yet. Okay. Thank you, though. Um, when you go over to the tabernacle, once a year on the, uh, October 10th, there was a day of atonement. The tabernacle was set up so that Israel had a way um, that they could be freed from their sins. They were sinning all the time back there. They just couldn't keep that covenant that was given from Mount Sinai. But Yahweh was able to provide a, uh, a freedom, uh, provide for them a day on October 10th that they would be freed from their sins. Um, um, so again, what I'm looking at and what I'm trying to get you to see these key, interesting, uh, fundamental ideas or principles he's laid down throughout the law and the prophets so that we could see who and what it is that he is and that he is part. You, you can't stop what he is. He is a provider. He can't not do that. Uh -huh. so, so when it comes to you and me and wonder, we often wonder uh, what he's doing. What is he doing? Why? What's going on with me? Why? Why? So on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, I got to give you an example. How much time do I got? Okay. Uh -huh. You might have not heard me. It's okay. I guess I'll find out. We'll let you know, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So I'm looking at this thing. Oops. Sorry, Wally, you got muted by accident. Could you unmute? Wait, can I get the uh, definition? Sure. Uh, provide. Make available for use, supply, to equip or supply someone with something useful or necessary, present or yield something useful, make adequate preparation for, supply sufficient uh, money to ensure the maintenance of someone, of a law, enable or allow something to be done. You got an Stipulated. etymology, Rick? Huh? You got an etymology? Um, yeah, it comes from Latin, unless it's really small for me, um, to see or foreseen, attend to, provide, to foresee, attend to. Okay, my definition picks up the etymology to be to see, and then it says see vision. So oh, what I'm trying, yeah. What, yeah. What, I'm, what I'm trying to get you to see from what I'm saying, is that is Yahweh Elohim is always causing people to have a vision. It means you're able to see. If you remember back in the in the, uh, it's, I can't remember where it's in the law, without a prophetic vision, the people perish. Yeah. So this is why you can have an understanding because Dr. Kinley said, here's the vision, make it plain. It's written on tables. He wrote it on these tables so that we could see the characteristics of his spirit unfolded. 
we made it plain so that we had an, we could have an idea how this thing works. So that when it comes down to the, his spirit being poured out on us, he's giving you the ability to be provided for of his spirit so that you can provide the inhabitants of this creation with the same blessings that you've been get, given. And, I'll, and, you, and you just, I got to give you this example because that's what I wanted to say. I recently took a, I took a fall and fractured a, a hip bone, a pelvic bone, and it's an excruciating pain. And when you get to the point of realizing that you have to have exercises and so on and so forth after you get done in order to fix the problem, well, the problem is when you have a hip, I mean, a pelvic fracture, is you have a problem with stability. We realize when we first came into class, another thing that was very easy for us to not see was we had no idea what stability was because we were so unstable in the world. We found out that we had no knowledge about Yahweh and his purpose. But we did come to find out, and it's in Isaiah 33 and 6, if someone would please get that. Isaiah 33, 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of Yahweh is his treasure. So we had come to find out that wisdom and knowledge was stability of our times. So when you need to fix your stability, there's exercises you have to do in the physical. Well, if, you, if you're not stable spiritually, what do you got to do? Well, it says to go to the law and the prophets so you can get your bearings, so that you can get your uh, uh, information straightened out, so you can see what Yahweh is doing, so you can start looking at his principles. That's where your starting point has to be, so you can realize who it is that's keeping you stable, that's keeping you um, grounded, that's keeping you uh, uh, rooted the way you're supposed to be. And it's, it's so an inter, such an interesting thing to watch that in every aspect of your life, every characteristic, uh, once you start seeing this thing, you realize that he just, he has no way of stopping being a provider. He's always going to do that. And uh, let's see. Going back to this thing with the Ukraine, when I seen this earlier on, I was like, holy cow, I think we're missing a whole lot of things. Here's this magnificent bounty of one of Yahweh's uh, things that, you know, we don't even really consider a lot of times how he is providing. Here he is providing everything for these people. They cried out and wanted help. Didn't the children of Israel cry out to Yahweh because of the bondage they were in? And didn't he come down and deliver them? We're seeing that manifestation going on right now uh, uh, in the Ukraine. What I'm suggesting you consider is he's doing the same for us spiritually. Here we are able to see this, our creator manifesting multiple things with the same vision that he's giving to all. And people are seeing different things, both in class and out of class. And with that, I want to thank you for this time. I do appreciate it. I hope you got something to consider and to think about. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Connell. At this time, we uh, call on the Dean of Syracuse, New York class, Dr. Patrick Trevison. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I thought Wally did a, a nice job there. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were the kinds of things when I first came into class that we just routinely worked with all the time. But then, you know, as time has gone on, we gone on to other things and, and uh, for instance, the reference of Isaiah 33 and six, we used to use that every class and we don't call for it as often anymore. Mm 
but it's so important. Uh, can we have that read again? Isaiah 33, 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Now, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Uh, first of all, you have to ask, what kind of wisdom and what kind of knowledge? Mankind, at this point in history, has amassed more knowledge than it has ever had in all the history of mankind. And yet there is less stability in the world now than there ever was. Really? So obviously the kind of wisdom and knowledge that he's talking about, it's not man's wisdom. It's not man's knowledge. He's talking about something spiritual, which is the principle that Wally was working with. It's, the, it's spiritual knowledge. It's knowledge of your creator. And it's the wisdom. It has to be divine wisdom that only he can impart to you. Um, mm -hmm. That's the only O-N-L-Y thing that is going to give you any stability because otherwise we would just be like everybody else in the world out here right now. And when you think about it, Not only does Yahshua provide for us in class, and we know that, and we try to be appreciative of that, and we try not to take that for granted, but he also provides for these people in the world. He gives them sustenance. He gives them clothing. He gives them food to eat. He gives them jobs. He gives them homes. And these are people that for the most part don't even care about him. And nevertheless, he provides for them. Just like he provides for us. But we are special in his eyes because we make up his bride and his bride is special to him mm. now let's go to the scripture reading and i'd like to read one two three and four and then jump down to seven first john this chapter. Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Messiah is born of Yahweh. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. So who whoever believes that Yahshua is the Messiah is born of Yahweh. And everyone that loves him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him, which is the love of the brethren. Now read to. By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh. When we love Yahshua and keep his commandments. When we love Yahshua and keep his commandments. Now, in the Old Covenant, they were given commandments that they promised that they would keep. Uh, let's get this reference. It's in, uh, 
It's in the 19th chapter of Exodus, and I think it's in the 24th chapter of Exodus. But we'll just pick it up in uh, Exodus 19. Not sure the verse. What are you, I'm not sure what you're looking for. Obey my voice. Keep my covenant and your treasure. Keep, yes, makes a covenant. Where he makes a covenant. Okay. Where they make a covenant with God. Oh. You mean like everything you said? We yes, do? yes. That's Exodus 24. Peg, I think if you start at five. Of Exodus 19, yeah? Yes, yeah. Okay. To pick up the, the principle. Okay. Ex oh, man, I lost it. Hang on. Exodus 19, five. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So this is Yahweh Elohim, and he's speaking to the children of Israel, and he's making this pact with them. Read. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Now Be this, they, they were to be a kingdom of priests, which is foreshadowing or pointing to the new covenant where now we are supposed to be a kingdom of priests, mm -hmm. or we are supposed to uh, minister one to another, as well as minister to anyone in the world that will listen to the gospel. Read. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh hath spoken, we will do. All that Yahweh hath spoken, we will do. Read. And Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear. That's when good. I That's good, Reed. Thank you. Now, so when we go back to 1 John, he says, By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh when we love Yahweh and keep his commandments. Now, they promised to keep his commandments back there. Mm -hmm. And they made a commitment to him. They made a promise to him. They made a covenant with him. Wow. They made a testament with him. Mm -hmm. And you see, they could not keep it. Right. it. It was not in them to keep it. They knew they were supposed to keep it, but their heart was far from him. And he says in there, I'm not sure where it is, oh, that there was such a heart in them. Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy? Yeah. 529. 529, yep. Deuteronomy 529. Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. Now, oh, that there was such a heart in them, that they would keep my commandments and fear me always. Mm -hmm. See, Yahweh Elohim, it's not that he gave this and then they didn't keep it and then he felt bad. He knew. He knew ahead of time they were not going to be able to keep the covenant. This is all part of his purpose as it's set in motion and as it's, as it's going, as it's progressing. Uh, you see, it's going to necessitate uh, a new covenant being brought forth. If they had been able to keep the old covenant, then this would have been the covenant 
that would have been the covenant forever. That would have been it. Right. But because they couldn't keep it, that necessitated a change. That necessitated a new covenant. Because in the old covenant, they did not have the heart in them. Their head knew what they were supposed to do, but their heart was far from him. Their heart wanted to do something else. Their head, their mind and their heart were, were not in conjunction with one another. They did not, they were not in sync. They were not in agreement. Now, he knew way up front and as things progressed and they went into Canaan land, they had promised him they would not worship other gods. They would not, do all the promises that they made to him, they broke. They broke every promise. They worshiped other gods. Mm -hmm. they, they, they worshiped Moloch. They worshiped Dagon. And they, there's, even references in the Old Testament where they caused their children to pass through the fire. Right. Or they, they sacrificed their very children to these gods. They went up in the groves, which were situations outside of Jerusalem where they would go up into uh, a, a circle of trees with a stone pillar in the middle. And they were, that represented the a phallus and it represented the, the female. And they would have orgies up there with these pagan deities and with these pagan peoples. They yeah. intermarried with these pagan peoples. They did all these things that provoked Yahweh Elohim to jealousy. And they provoked him to anger and they provoked him to wrath. And all this was meant to be, all this was meant to happen. Uh, when we love Yahweh and keep his commandments. And then read the third verse, please, in the scripture reading. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Now, his commandments are not grievous. If you look over in the margin, my margin, the translators, for grievous, it says hard to obey. His commandments are not hard to obey. Now that's, this is AD 90. This is 60 years after Pentecost, roughly. 60 years after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And this is the new covenant where this is being written and he's making the statement that his commandments are not grievous or they're not hard to obey and the reason for that is and i'll let uh, i'll let the holy spirit explain it instead of me let's go right over to ezekiel the 36th chapter and uh I'd like to pick it right up in the 15th verse, but to save time, let's go, let's go to the 24th verse. Ezekiel 36, 24, for I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Now, this is the Holy Spirit. This is Yahweh Elohim or Yahshua. And he's speaking to Israel and he's saying, I will bring you out of all countries. Because they had been scattered to all countries. 
and they have been taken into captivity. And I will bring you into your own land. Mm -hmm. And he has brought us from all countries mm -hmm. and from all different world religions mm -hmm. and brought us into our own land or the Holy Land or a place where if Yahshua is in you, that makes it to be the holy land. It's not a physical place anymore. It's not physical Israel anymore, um, where the world thinks that's the holy land. It's, a, it's an entirely spiritual thing. And He's brought us into our own land, the Holy Land. Read. Read. Um, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And, and, I will, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Now, the water is not physical water. The water is spiritual water. The water is, is going to cleanse you inwardly. In the old covenant, they had to get in physical water. There were physical water baptisms. Uh, you have that chart, Greg? Which one? Uh, the covenants. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Here we are. Now in the old covenant, over on the left, it says Old Testament is fulfilled. Or and there's a scroll and it says carnal mind. It's natural. It's physical. It's earthly. It's temporary. And a carnal mind and carnal ordinances go together. These carnal ordinances were given to Israel because they had a carnal mind. And that's why he said, oh, that there was such a heart in them. They didn't have a spiritual heart inside them. And these, com these commandments were not inward to them. They were not internalized with them. They were just an outward thing that they knew in their mind they were supposed to keep. And it was imposed on them. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things was physical water baptism. And it's over here on the left, it says baptisms. And the priest in the tabernacle had to cleanse in water and the sacrifices had to be put in water in the labor in the court roundabout of the tabernacle. So there were baptisms, there were immersions. And no matter how many times they did this, it did not clean them up inwardly. It could not cleanse them inwardly. Uh, let's keep reading here in Ezekiel. And then after that, I want to go over to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Go ahead and read. 33 verse of Ezekiel, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I now cleanse. he's going to cleanse you from all your nonsense from, from mm -hmm. oh from everything from hatred from lust from your own ego from uh, believing that Jesus was the name to a uh, belief in a trinity to belief in a, uh, that, that, that the old covenant was in reality, the new covenant, to everything that you believed, 
everything was just a mistake. Everything you believed was in error. You had been lied to your entire life. Mm -hmm. And we had to be brought down to these lectures and sat down and the founder, Yahshua in him, knew that for these lectures to be successful, they were going to have to be put into an environment where people could not all be talking at once and raising their hands and all debating and doing, because it would be chaos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could have been enlightened on a bar stool. We could have been enlightened uh, mowing the lawn. We could have been enlightened anywhere. He could have done this, done this any way that he wanted to do it. But we had to be taken out of the world, so to speak, away from everything and brought down to a lecture and sat down in a chair where it was quiet and we had to be still. Right. As has been brought out already today. And we had to listen and shut our mouths and listen. And it was just like Israel back there at Mount Sinai. He could have dealt with them while they were in Egypt. He had, there were 430 years that he could have done that. But they had to be brought out of darkness, out of Egypt, out of the world, so to speak, out of a death-like situation, out of slavery, and brought into an entirely different environment and brought to Mount Sinai, and that was where they were given a covenant. We had to be brought out of the world, sat down in a class, shut up and listen. And that's when he gave us the heart. He had to give us the heart. You didn't choose to do this on your own. He had to give you the heart to be able to hear and to understand what was being taught. Oh, that there was such a heart in them. He had to give you the heart. And the clear water that he's sprinkling on you then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. That's the gospel. That's the truth. And it's cleansing you inwardly now. The old baptism cleansed them outwardly, but it didn't do anything for their inner man. You had to be cleaned up inwardly. Right. Hatred, got to go. You thinking you're the center of the universe, got to go. You thinking Jesus was the name, got to go. Oh, you got to be cleansed of all of it. Mm -hmm. And we're saying a whole lot of stuff just to explain a sentence or two, but this is what this is this is where the boss is leading me. This is where I'm going. So uh, go back to this, go back to where we're reading in Ezekiel, please. Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. Now a new heart. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments. Oh, 
that there was such a heart in them. Now he's saying, a new heart will I give you. Why? So that you would have the heart in you to keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. So that you would have that heart in you. And it's him that's given you the heart. Right. You're not deciding to do it because you can't do it on your own. Read, please. And a new spirit will I put within you. A new spirit, one that you didn't have before. The Holy Spirit. Now, let's hold this here. I know I'm off in all kinds of directions, but I've got to go uh, to Acts, the second chapter. Start reading right in one. Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, Yahshua has died. He was buried. He resurrected. And then 50 days later, 50 days later, Penta meaning five or principle 50 or five, just like back at Mount Sinai, there was a prince, the same principle, it's repeating, the same principle. Read. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all of one accord. And in one place, just like hopefully, when we come to class, we're all of one accord and in one place. Read. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. As of a mighty rushing wind, a fulfillment of Ezekiel, 37th chapter where it talks about the Valley of Dry Bones, that mighty rushing wind, that breath, that name of Yahweh being breathed on those dry bones and causing them to come together and live. Oh, my goodness. Read, please. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. All the house where they were sitting the house they were sitting in, and their house. You live in a house, folks. Right. And it filled their house. And it's filled our house. Our house. As Peter said, I must take off this, my tabernacle, or physical house. Read. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Cloven tongues as a by fire, because John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there is one that cometh after me who is mightier than me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to fill. He will baptize you with what with fire and with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So now here's the fire. You gotta be filled with fire, folks. Mm -hmm. You know, some folks have some incredible ardor and zeal. That is, that, that's a gift. That's a gift to always have that ardor and zeal like that. We can never Take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Never become complacent. Read, please. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And now they're filled with the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when that happens, 
it brought in a brand new age. It started a brand new age. And the Holy Spirit right at that point was put in mankind on a permanent basis for the first time in history. And it's still being done today. And hopefully it's being done every time we preach the gospel and every time we have a live class or a Zoom class. Read. Uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak. That's with good. Now I want to go back to the scripture reading where we had left off. First John 5 and verse 4. No, uh, Ezekiel, I'm sorry. Okay. Ezekiel 33. And we'll read verse 26 again. A new heart also will I give you. And now the new heart was given to them on the day of Pentecost. A new heart. A brand new heart, which you see over on the right hand side of this chart. It says New Testament, New Covenant is written in your heart and mind. These charts are loaded, folks, with information when you yes. when you realize what's going on. Go ahead and read. And a new spirit will I put within you. A new spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's not that's not the spirit that you had in you when you walked into this class the first time. For real. But this is a new spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. This is Yahshua. Mm -hmm. This is Yahshua right in you. Yahshua's Holy Spirit. Read. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. The stony heart, that old heart, that hard heart that couldn't be obedient, that couldn't listen. They couldn't feel. Read. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I will give you a, a living heart, a warm heart, a soft heart, like was brought out last night in the lecture. Kindness. Kind, genuine kindness. Read. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Oh, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Now we'll go back to the scripture reading. First John 5. And we're going to go over the third verse again. 3. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments. That we keep his commandments. Why? Because he's causing us to walk in them. You can't do it on your own. He has to cause you to walk in his commandments. And when he's doing the causing, then you just do it naturally. Mm -hmm. right. You just go about your business and you just, you just, you just do. Mm -hmm. You just do. Because he's causing, he's causing it. He's causing you to walk the way he wants you to walk. It's such a difference from the old covenant where they had to stress and strive and worry about. You know, they just constantly walked around 
in a state of condemnation because they could not be obedient. Now finish reading that third verse. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. They're not grievous. They're not hard to obey because he's taking care of it. He's taking care of it. Talk about a provider. He's taking care of everything. Mm -hmm. oh. Now, I, um, I had talked about Hebrews, the ninth chapter. If we could go over there, I think pick it up around, uh, I don't know, eight or so, or... Um, which stood in only in meats and drinks, or you want it higher? Oh. Which was a figure? I, yeah, okay. Uh, Hebrews 9 and 9. Okay, 8. The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Or to the most holy place was not yet made manifest. In the old covenant, it was not yet made manifest. Only the high priest could go in there and only once a year. So the way in there was not yet made manifest. It was not made apparent mm -hmm. it was it had been closed to mankind right. until the day of pentecost read while as the first tabernacle was yet standing yes which was a figure for the time then present now that was a figure that was a figure it was pointing to something it was pointing to something. The most holy place now being your cranial cavity, your head cavity. That's your most holy place. And you can see into the most holy place. You can see in there. You can know something about Yahweh. For the first time in all of recorded history, this is something. Read. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. On uh, which were offered gifts and sacrifices back under the old covenant. Read. That could not make him that did the service perfect. That could not make him or the priest, even the high priest, who did the service perfect. It could not make him perfect. Read. As pertaining to the conscience. As pertaining to the conscience. Now, if it couldn't make the high priest perfect, then it certainly couldn't make the low priests perfect, and it couldn't make the Levites perfect, not to mention the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. It could not make them perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And I, I don't know about you, I was raised Roman Catholic, and walked around in a state of condemnation all the time. And the, the Catholics, they put this guilt trip on you that's amazing. And they keep it on you. They keep it on you. Right. Read. Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them 
until the time of Reformation. Now, this was imposed on them. This old covenant was imposed on them. This new covenant is not grievous. It's not imposed on us. This is not an imposition. We do this willingly. We do this gladly. We do this happily. Hopefully we do this happily. We want to do this. This is such a difference from the old covenant. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, we used to groan, my brother and me, oh, we got to go to church again. Oh, we, <laughs> you know, you only had to go to, class, to church once a week <laughs> and sit for an hour or an hour and a half. And if we hated it, it was imposed on us. And it was boring. And you didn't learn anything. And you got up and you knelt down. And you got up and you knelt down. And you got up and you knelt down. And it was boring. And we learned not one single thing about our creator. Not even his name. And they know the name. They know the name. They learn it in theology school. Right. They know those names. They know that name of Yahshua. They know Jesus isn't right. Mm -hmm. And they do not give the truth to the people. This is not grievous to us. We do this willingly. And I just want to go to Jeremiah 31 and 31, please. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant. Now here's another witness in Jeremiah where he talks about how he's going to make a new covenant. He's going to make a new covenant because the old, they couldn't keep. They broke it and broke it and broke it and broke it time and time again. And they broke Yahweh's heart. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and saw that they had built the golden calf. You can put the Moses chart there, Greg, if you would. Thank you. Moses came down, and you see him. He's holding up the laws in stone. And they're not in the shape of a tombstone. They are in the shape of a heart. Because Yahweh had written in there, so it's Yahweh's heart. And Moses brought down those laws, and he saw that they had built the golden calf, which, you understand, right away they started breaking his commandments. Right. He, one of them was, you shall have no other gods before me. And then they said, these are the gods which brought us up out of Egypt. And they knew it was Yahweh that had brought them up out of Egypt. So they put other gods before him. Now, here they are. They're dancing around. They're partying. Moses comes down. He's angry. He gets hot. He throws the stones down and breaks them. Or he broke Yahweh's heart. Not Moses. Not Moses, but the people broke Yahweh's heart because they had made a marriage with him. Right. He was the husband, 
They were the bride and they cheated on him. They broke his heart. Now he tells Moses, in the 34th chapter, I think, bring up a new set of stones. And I will write in the new set of stones. So Moses brings up a set of stones. And this time, it's Moses' heart. And Yahweh writes, Yahweh Elohim writes in that set of stones. So he's writing in Moses' heart or in the people's hearts. It's showing that in the new covenant, the new testament would be written in our heart. And this set was placed in the tabernacle, showing that the new heart was placed in the tabernacle or in the person. Mm -hmm. Right in the tabernacle, right in the person. The new heart was going to be placed right within us. See, the second time it was written in Moses' heart or in the people's heart. And this chart shows the tabernacle of man and the tabernacle pattern and man made by the pattern and the new heart in your holy place you understand? There's correlations that go back and forth. But this new heart got placed in the tabernacle. This new set of stones, it was placed in the most holy place, in the Ark of the Covenant, which correlates to your most holy place, or it's placed in our most holy place, or our our gray and white matter, our brain. Hold this one, hold this thought one second. I gotta come back to Jeremiah, but I wanna go over to, I think it's Exodus 25 and two, or wait a minute, it might not be Exodus, it might be Leviticus. Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25, 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto Yahweh. No, it's oh, not it. I, I want word. Leviticus 2. Sorry. I, it was 25. Oh. 2, 2. Is that what you want? Leviticus 2, 2. What do you want? There I will commune with thee. Oh, I think that Leviticus 16 to try that. Uh 16 to thank you. Also Exodus 25, 22. <clears throat> Leviticus 16, 2. You got we got a bunch of Bible scholars out here. And Yahweh said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron thy brother. Now he said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron thy brother. Aaron was going to be the high priest. Read. Did he come not at all times into the holy place? No, and he just don't just come traipsing into this most holy place anytime you feel like it. Read within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. And I want where and there I will commune with thee. It's the Exodus. This is 25, verse 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. And there I will meet with thee in this most holy place, in this most holy place of the tabernacle, and I will commune with thee. All right. I will talk with you. I will communicate with you. Now, 
in the new covenant, that's your most holy place. That's your brain. And this is where your creator, this is where Yahshua dwells, and this is where he's communicating with you. From I your mercy, please. okay, Thank from you. your mercy seat, he's communicating with you. Right. He's communicating with you every single day. It's beautiful. You don't have to go down to St. Cecilia's. You don't have to go into the confession box. You can just sit in your backyard and watch the Baltimore Orioles eat their food, and you can communicate with your creator. Now, go back to where we were. Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, I'm getting there. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand. This new covenant will not be like the old covenant. So if the old one was natural, the new one will be spiritual. If the old one was physical, the new one will not be physical. If the old one was earthly, the new one will be heavenly. If the old one was temporary, the new one will be permanent. Mm -hmm. Just that simple, folks. Read, please. Uh, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them. He was yeah. a husband, but they broke his heart. Read. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Oh, now it's Israel. Not Israel and Judah, but just Israel. Why? Because it's one. It's not split anymore. It's not divisions anymore. His body is one. It's unified. Read. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I'll put it right in you and write it right in your heart. Mm -hmm. And will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. And he'll be your Elohim and you will be his people. You will be his assembly. You will be his wife. You will be his bride. Mm -hmm. And with that, I know I didn't get past the third or fourth verse there, but um, you know, I thank you for the opportunity to say something. I hope that it was uh, edifying to someone. And uh, I thank Joshua because he gave me what to say. He gave me what to say and uh, all praise belongs to him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Trevison. And for our next speaker, we will call on the Dean of Rhode Island, Dr. Susan Sikowski. Whoa, good morning. Um, really enjoyed the previous speakers and all of the information that's been brought out. Um, stimulated a number of things. Could we go back into the scripture reading for a moment into first John? And let me go there with you to tell you what verse it is that I'm looking for. I have a few things that um, in particular, what the previous speaker was talking about in the body um, made me think about that I'd like to try and um, do with the remaining time here. Um, let's see. Let's start at one. First John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Messiah is born of Yahweh. And every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. All right. So let's stop there for a moment. Um, in reading this, 
my mind always goes to um, some of the natural examples that um, uh, are allegories or um, kind of the parables that relate to the things that we read about in the scriptures. And I'm not somebody, I tend to think very simply, um, not overly profound, um, but the things that Yahweh shows me um, kind of constantly pull the natural creation in to mm -hmm. witness to me the things that are made that show us things that are spiritual or that are the invisible things of him. So when this particular verse was read, it made me think of the natural relationship between um, or within families where um, if you have a son or a daughter and um, you love them and then they have children, um, those that are begotten of them, there's a natural love that extends to the grandchildren and mm -hmm. the, the joy and the excitement that people have when families expand and have you know, the offspring that are there. So this verse made me think of that relationship and how if you love someone and they have um, children or they get married, um, that love extends to the rest of the, the family. And we see that in the natural. Keep reading. Mm -hmm. By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh when we love Yahweh and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. All right. So um, for these verses, um, grievous um, it can also be picked up in the Greek. Um, one of the speakers talked about how grievous in the margin said not hard to keep. In the Greek, it picks up are not weighty, are not burdensome and um, takes you back to thinking about the scripture about take my yoke on me and my burden mm -hmm. is light. And mm -hmm. um, so he's talking about keeping the, the things, the law of the spirit under the new covenant and how it's not difficult or it's not a weighty thing to do. It actually, um, as you see yourself grow in the spirit, it becomes very natural um, for that to happen and what we would call second nature which at the time then is really our first nature after you've been, um, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. Um, if we go to um, John, the Gospel of John, the, I think it's the 15th chapter where they're um, at the Passover supper and Yahshua is talking to the disciples. Um, I wanna pick it up, let's see. Um, Let's start at 10. John 15 and verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All right, so here we get a sense of the commandment from Yahshua, um, allowing for the fact that it is before the day of Pentecost, but he's talking to them to give them some insight as to a change that's going to happen um, and how he, in one way, how he's defining a commandment to them. And the commandment is, or the discussion is, verse 13, if you would reread that, please. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Okay, so um, we recently, we've been working in the Rhode Island class um, recently on the immune system and the COVID virus and the things that have um, occurred from a natural standpoint in the bodies of people that have, have had COVID and some of the things that they have found out and are publishing papers on kind of after the fact, after having a year or two of um, experience and, and the ability to research some of these things. And um, there's an example of this principle about greater love than this has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Um, 
I'm going to read a brief excerpt from one of the articles that we had um, talked about, actually a couple of lines. Um, let's see, from the early days of the pandemic, doctors noticed that in severe cases of COVID-19, the ones that landed people in the hospital on ventilators with shredded lungs, mm -hmm. most of the internal wreckage wasn't being directly inflicted by the virus itself but by a blizzard of immune reactions triggered by the body to fight off the infection. Researchers knew that these so-called cytokine storms were damaging, but they didn't know why the COVID virus seemed to be so good at setting them off. A new study published Wednesday in the journal Nature, um, and this article is, I can give Sharon the information to pass out, but this was a recently published article um, in early April. So um, a new study published Wednesday in the journal Nature is helping to explain how these immune reactions happen to COVID-19 patients. The study revealed that the virus can infect certain kinds of immune cells called monocytes and macrophages. They are white blood cells and they are the frontline workers of the immune system. Their job is to circulate in the blood and the tissues to find and destroy right. pathogens. Mm -hmm. They do this by eating or really by surrounding and absorbing threats like viruses to keep them from being able to infect other cells. So these, these particular immune cells, they surround and absorb threats like viruses to keep them from infecting other cells says once a bad actor or an invading um, type of cell like a virus is absorbed, these cells can ha have what can best be described as cellular garbage disposals called an yeah. endosome that normally shuts the infectious agent down. In the case of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, however, this doesn't happen. The virus gets out of the endosome and escapes back into the body of the cell where it starts making copies of itself. So if you picture the analogy they use here, the garbage, the cellular garbage disposal, it would be as if you put stuff down your garbage disposal, turned it on, and instead of it going down the drain and being disposed of like what the intent is, the garbage comes back out of the garbage disposal, escapes into your kitchen and starts multiplying itself. That's what's happening in these cells with the virus. The viruses not only get taken up, but once they get taken in, the virus starts replicating. And that was a surprise when the researchers did the research. Now it says a virus starting to make copies of itself in the body is never a good thing. But when this happens to the protector cells, these immune cells, it sets off a next level set of alarms. Now um, going to another article related to the same discussion, it says, um, one thing they've observed is that the virus copies itself very quickly once it infects a cell. And there's a lot of stress on the cell in a small amount of time. The cell begins to send out SOS signals. And when the cell senses that there is something foreign, that there is something bad happening, the immediate response of the cell is to kill itself. It is a protective mechanism so it doesn't, the problem doesn't spread to the other cells. So this is an example in the body of um, a cell laying its life down for the other cells so that the problem doesn't spread to, to the other cells. It has a, a mechanism that once it's um, enclosed in the virus and does what it's supposed to do, it, it actually um, shuts itself down and um, doesn't allow the, in order for the virus not to, not to expand. Now, um, that initially sounds like maybe a dramatic response to an invasion, but it's your body set up to um, manifest the principle of laying its life down so that the brethren can be protected from, um, uh, a, as they call a bad actor, um, a virus or um, pollution of, um, of a healthy cell or um, an attack by an infectious agent. So that's what happens within within your lungs. Now that one article talked about shredded lungs and there were various descriptions when you read about the COVID virus and what happened to people, particularly the ones that were so severely affected, they needed to be on ventilators. Some 
patients made it, some patients did not recover and passed away. And the, the number of people who have died from the COVID virus, I think is now approaching, or they're predicting it's gonna be about a million people in the United States before this whole thing kind of winds itself down, uh, um, which at the moment there's some new variants that ha have the numbers creeping up again. But I wanted to read something from um, Tabers about the lungs because the more I started to um, think about all this, now the lungs, um, Greg, could you go to the body tabernacle um, chart if you would and put it up for a moment. And as we talk about the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit and the way Yahweh has set the, the pattern and the purpose up, if we look at the body, um, we know that the, the lungs in the human body are located in the holy place and they correlate to the altar of incense in the tabernacle pattern. And the altar of incense served the purpose of um, where the priest needed to minister and offer up prayers and incense unto Yahweh in the tabernacle. So it was a place of intercession, um, a place of um, uh, prayers being offered up. And in the body, when we take a look at that, the incense was um, made of four main ingredients and it was a, a secret mixture known only to the priesthood to prepare in the body, the lungs are where you um, breathe in the oxygen and the carbon dioxide is expelled out of the body. And there's four main ingredients in the air that we breathe. And it's the place where um, that Yahweh, when he created the body, expressly set up where his name was going to be manifest. So when you breathe, and we um, witness this all the time, and if we're quiet, or if we need to do something that helps us to calm down, we focus on the name of Yahweh, which is on our breath. Breathe in, Yah, and you breathe out, way. And it's something that happens unconsciously or not even aware of it most of the time until we're stressed or have asthma or something causes us to hear our breath. But we're breathing the name of Yahweh constantly. Um, could somebody get a, Psalms 150 and 6? There are some things in the Bible that actually talk about this. And then once somebody calls your attention to it, which they did in the first class that I attended, it's just like an amazing thing that your body is actually um, witnessing to your creator at such a level that you're not aware of it, but it's going on constantly throughout your lifetime from the moment you're born um, to the moment that you pass away, you are praising the, the name of your creator. Yes. Psalms 150 verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise Yahweh. Praise ye Yahweh. All right. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. So any creature, man and animals um, that has breath, breathes the name of Yahweh, testifies to that name of the creator. And um, again, as I mentioned, in your body, Yahweh chose the lungs to be the, the organ or the vessel that was going to manifest his name. And so if you look into the lungs, this is out of a Tabers, and um, I'm going to read just a very brief description, because this also... The more you learn about the body and the way that it testifies to your creator, the more it just flabbergasts you, the more amazing it is to your mind um, at a level of detail that we could never conceive and that mankind, scientists, doctors could never create in and of themselves. It had, it, it's a divine, divinely inspired dwelling place that, that we walk around with and don't even pay attention to much of the time. Um, under... Uh, in Tabers under lungs, it says the primary function or purpose of the lung is to bring air and blood into intimate contact so that oxygen can be added to the blood and carbon dioxide can be removed. This is achieved by two pumping systems, one moving a gas and the other a liquid. The blood and air are brought together so closely that less than one micrometer of tissue separate them. 
the volume of the pulmonary capillary circulation. Now, in your lungs, um, Greg, I think on the green chart, if you'd slide over, I think we have a picture that shows um, a little bit about the lungs, if I remember correctly. I'm looking. Um, it may or may not be what I'm recalling here. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so if we go back, um, I was going to say, if we go back, um, okay, excellent, thank you. Um, here's a closer picture of the lungs. And if you know anything about the lungs, and we're keeping it really simple here, but in the lungs, there's a bronchial tree, which comes down from your mouth and your airway, and then branches off um, by bronchi um, that go into each of your two lungs. And they call that branching off and going into smaller and smaller vessels in the lungs, the bronchial tree. It's like an upside down tree um, in your lungs. And coming off of all of those little extensions that you can see painted on the chart goes into smaller and smaller extensions and little, um, uh, they yeah. call them L alveoli. And they're yeah. little clusters like clusters of grapes Mm -hmm. um, down in the lungs, which is where the exchange between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide take place when mm -hmm. you're breathing in and breathing out. And so in this description that I'm reading, the volume of the pulmonary capillary circulation, so the blood vessels that are down in your lungs that are part of that, um, where in the blood the oxygen is taken in and the carbon dioxide is given off in your lungs, um, is the volume is 150 milliliters, but this is spread out over a surface area of 750 square feet. The capillary surface area surrounding the 300 million air sacs you have, so the alveoli that are in these two lobes of your lungs are 300 million air sacs. Now that's what you've got inside of you while you're sitting here listening to this lecture in your chest area, you have 300 million air sacs. And the blood, which is poor in oxygen, but high in carbon dioxide, is in contact with the air um, and does the exchange um, in this um, over constantly over the course of your lifetime. Now, that just blew my mind as to the amount of tissue that Yahweh has in those lungs that do this process of exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year going on in there, manifesting the, the um, that everything that has breath praises the name of Yahweh and allows your body to take in the oxygen it needs and to dispose of the carbon dioxide that um, is a waste product and is harmful to the body if you're not able to have it taken out. That bronchial tree um, it functions in that way. Now, the piece that goes with this is, um, and I know recently um, Rick Triveston has given a lecture on that um, article in National Geographic about saving the forests and how the trees work and how um, there's a scripture in John that talks about Yahshua um, curing the blindness of a man. And when he um, had um, touched and put mud on the, the man's eyes and, and then st he started to see again. The first thing he saw, he said was, I see men as trees walking. So he wasn't seeing clearly the physical creation around him. He was seeing kind of an intermediate step and having a vision of seeing men as trees walking and made the correlation about men and trees. And so, um, when Rick was doing the, the lecture on that, I appreciated a lot of the points that, that he was making and the correlations he was making. But I had seen that, that edition of National Geographic. I got as far as page four, read a sentence that said, um, forests keep our world in balance. They're the lungs of the planet drawing in carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen. So they function the opposite of mankind. They take in carbon dioxide, they give off oxygen, which this symbiotic relationship is very important to our health and to the health of the planet. I got as far as they're the lungs of the planet. 
and didn't get any any further. That stopped me in my tracks because I had never thought about that kind of a comparison or an analogy. And then I realized you have a bronchial tree and you have all these things that Yahweh is doing with the body that um, are also in principle the same things that happen with the plant kingdom or the trees. And um, so um, we already got in Acts, the second chapter, where Rick was talking about the day of Pentecost and what happened. Um, if somebody would go to Acts 2 for a moment and just hold it, I'd like to get um, back in Genesis, in I think it's the second chapter where Yahweh created Adam. Um, if we could read what happened very briefly back there, I think it's in the, in the King James Version. I think it's about verse six or seven. Seven. Uh, Genesis 2, 7. And Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right. So at the beginning of the physical creation with mankind, Yahweh created Adam out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Mm -hmm. So you can picture Yahweh um, breathing in Yahweh Elohim, breathing into Adam, the name of Yahweh, breathe in Yah and, and outweigh. And that breathing in of the, of the Yah, um, brought Adam to life. He became a living, a living soul, a living creature. So that was a, um, uh, an example or a, a manifestation of a mush rushing mighty wind into the body of Adam as he was laying lifeless after his initial creation and that mu rushing mighty wind brought him to life or made him a living soul. Um, in um, Exodus, we're not going to go there, but in Exodus, the 14th chapter where they're going, um, they've been delivered out of, uh, from Egypt. They're on their way out of Egypt and they come to the Red Sea. And it says that Yahweh caused the Red Sea to go back by a mighty east wind or strong east wind and it kept the waters rolled back for Israel to go through the Red Sea while they were leaving Egypt going into the wilderness. So again there was life given or salvation given by a rushing wind that allowed the waters to roll back and the people to go through on dry ground. Right. Um, in um, Rick mentioned Ezekiel 37 with the valley of dry bones, and it was the breathing on of um, the, the inspiration and the, um, the breath of Yahweh onto those dry bones that brought them mm -hmm. back and made mm -hmm. them living, living souls. Yep. So um, that's another example. So let's go back into Acts 2, if you could, um, starting at the first verse again. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. All right. And so it's already been discussed that that rushing mighty wind on the day of Pentecost, it filled the house. They were in an upper room, um, all gathered together there in a building, and it filled that physical room, blew through that room, and it also um, filled them as a manifestation of being um, filled with the Holy Spirit. It right. was the, um, the pour, outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those gathered in that upper room that day, and that rushing mighty wind was um, the, the fulfillment or the spiritual reality of what happened to Adam on the day of his creation, that, that rushing mighty wind made him a living soul. And in this case, it resurrected their souls or, or um, filled them with a new heart and a new mind um, with um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was an incredible event that changed the course of, of mankind at that point mm -hmm. in time, not recognized by most of the world. Most of the world, main Christian world comments on the day of Pentecost, but doesn't truly appreciate what actually happened on that day. And it was when 
the opportunity to be born again, um, if, if we get um, John, the, the third chapter with Nicodemus, if somebody would go there for a moment, the um, day of Pentecost was like spiritual CPR. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. if you know anything about CPR, the acronym stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And it is used when um, somebody has like a heart attack and their heart stops and you're trying to keep um, oxygen flowing in their um, body, particularly to their brain, waiting for help to come. So you have um, a person giving mighty rushing wind, i.e. blowing into somebody's nose and mouth. Now, the more modern day version, they're doing more compressions and not worrying as much about the oxygen, but the oxygen is still critical to the brain. And so um, we find um, that that natural example of of um, trying to save somebody in the flesh um, when their Five heart minutes, Dr. Sikowski. Thank you. Um, when, when their heart stops or they have an event that causes something to require CPR, the spiritual CPR was truly performed on the day of Pentecost. And they were given a new heart and a new mind and that rushing of oxygen, which typifies the spirit going through them at that point. So let's get um, to finish up with that John third chapter with um, uh, Nicodemus, please. Run it from one, sir. Yeah, start there. We'll just try to quickly read down through. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Yahshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from Yahweh, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except Elohim be with him. Yes, All right, so Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was also a ruler of the Jews. Um, the transcript we were reading in class the other day, it pointed out that he was one of 70 elders who made up the, um, the rabbinate, so to speak, because if you think back um, when the elders, the 70 elders were with Moses, went up partway up the mountain, they were the leadership of Israel at the time. And that principle carries through to here with Doc talking about Nicodemus being one of 70 who were the rulers of the Jews at the time. And he said, we know, not I know, we know that you are a teacher from, from Yahweh. So mm -hmm. he's, he's telling on them that they recognize there was something special to, to Yahshua, even though they wouldn't admit it in public. Read. Three, Yahshua answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahweh. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yes. And so answered. Nicodemus, who has a natural mind and is struggling to understand what Yahshua is saying to him, when he hears the phrase born again, he can only think about from a natural birth. He knows what happens. And so then he goes, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Read. Five, Yahshua answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Keep reading. Nic Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Yahshua answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? All right, really so Yahshua is asking him what is really a rhetorical question. Um, he talks about the wind. He uses the natural example of the wind blowing where it goes. You can hear the sound thereof, but can't tell from whence it came or where it goes. That's an example of the spirit. The natural mind can't, can't perceive what's going on with the spirit. And um, he says, are you a master of Israel and you don't know these things? Are you claiming to be a teacher and somebody um, who should have authority in teaching the people and they should listen to you, but you don't understand these things? Because um, 
I know, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. You receive mm-hmm. not our witness. Mm-hmm. That's what happens in this class. We try to show people to the best mm-hmm. of our ability that which we have seen and that which we do know. And we hope that they receive our witness. And in a lot of cases, the earthly things, the things that are made, tell us of or give us a start. They open the door into looking at the heavenly things, the spiritual mm-hmm. or invisible things that, um, that are in the realm that we're really searching after. And mm-hmm. that this concept I was trying to get across of spiritual CPR, um, that's what happens. We walk in DOA and somebody does spiritual resuscitation on us in this class. And mm-hmm. then um, hope that it brings you back without um, brain damage, lack of oxygen from a natural standpoint can cause brain damage, that we can continue to sit and listen and meditate, ask questions, look for proof, and really um, listen with a, um, an open ear, open heart, open mind to those words of Yahweh. And I turn mm-hmm. it back over to the moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Sikowski, and everyone that has uh, participated in um, this Ithaca class. We really do appreciate your participation. And we will end with a doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let the class say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah.